these are not butter churns, they are bread pails full of rising and falling dough, all to make this giant loaf of rye bread today on the French chef. The French Chef is made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. Today we are doing rye bread, and we're using a wonderful French system that you can use for any kind of bread, like white bread, whole wheat bread, oatmeal bread, but it's particularly good with rye bread because it makes a bread that's full of flavor and texture and chewiness, and it has that good old country quality. In France, it would be called pain de campagne, and it starts out with a yeast batter, which is called a pouliche, spelled P-O-U-L-I-S-H. And this is a batter which is made out of yeast, flour, and water. And we want to start out with one package, either of dry active or of fresh yeast. This is a dry active yeast that's going to be dissolved in two thirds cup of tepid water. And the pulish, this, uh, this pulish batter is something that exists in many languages, this happens to be Viennese, that the French Viennese bakers did. And now we want to have water for the yeast that should be about 100 to 110 degrees. And if you're not used to knowing the warmth of water, put in your thermometer and test it with your finger so that you get some kind of an idea of what 100 degrees is. And this, I'm going to put this into the yeast, and then you want to make sure that that is completely dissolved, and that takes uh, four or five minutes, and here's one that already is dissolved, which has to be absolutely liquid, and that is very important. And then we want to have four cups of all-purpose flour, one, and measure it just like this, dipping your dry measure cup into the flour and leveling it off with something. And that's about as accurate a measurement in cups as you can get. There's four cups of all-purpose flour. And in goes our one package of yeast dissolved in two-thirds cup of warm water. And then I want some tepid water of about 75 degrees. And I want, heavens, three cups. So I pour it into the yeast cup here spilling none of it, which I have. One, two, I'm not going to have quite enough. The idea is uh, to start the yeast moving, you want the whole thing to be at about 75 degrees. And if you were working in a, in a bakery and were very scientific, everything would be measured and calibrated and thermostated. And if your flour, say if you happen to keep your flour in the refrigerator or down in the cellar and the flour were cold, it would be a good idea to put it in a roasting pan and just let it warm up just until it was the chill had been taken off. Because if your flour is too cold, then it will take your yeast too long to start working. Now I'm just mixing that up, you see, with a, a, a whip. And it is really just like a, a batter, sort of like a pancake batter. And this is, would be called in this country, rather than a pouliche, it would be called a yeast starter. Or in Boston, we would call it a starter. And the purpose of it is to get the yeast going, because the yeast feeds upon the starch in the flour. And if it's a very liquid mixture, like this batter, the yeast can quickly eat up all the starch and when it has eaten it practically all up, it is bubbly like this. Look at, you can see around 
the sides there where they're just bubbly holes and you look in at the top and these are bubbles that are slowly going blub, 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 blub. If somebody said it looks a little bit like tapioca pudding. And if you lift it up, look at that consistency. And this in the old days, or you should say, if I could say in the beginning, there was no yeast. There weren't any yeast cakes. Yeast cakes were not even invented until about 1870. And your great-grandmother had to make all of her own yeast herself, herself, because yeast is wild organisms floating around in the air. And if you make a mixture, say, of, of rye, flour, and hops, and I don't know what they used to use, eventually the, it would just begin to start bubbling, and you would have started your own yeast. And so you would make this kind of a starter, and then you would use half of it to make your dough, and then you'd mix in some more flour and water and let it rise and bubble again and use it the next time. And gradually it began getting a little sour. And that was, that was uh, how the whole business of sourdough started in. In French usage, the poulice is used immediately after it's made because they don't make sourdough bread at all. And this takes about two and a half hours to rise up to this beautiful, bubbly, tapioca look. And what's good about it is that this kind of a beginning mixture makes, gives a lovely moist texture to the bread. And you can use it perfectly well for making plain French bread with white flour, but it's just awfully good with rye flour. And it's now ready to mix with the rye flour. And you can, of course, mix it all by hand. Or if you have a heavy duty machine, you can use that. Or you can use one of these bread pail, pails. And this is, this is what it looks like. It has this dough hook here and a crank. And you just, you just put in your mixture. Look at that. Isn't that a wonderful looking? You just put all that in. And then you add your flour. And I'm going to add, you have to, you can add, if you want 12, this can take 12 cups of flour, but I'm not going to add 12 cups of rye flour because that would make such a terribly heavy bread. I'm going to use 8 cups of rye. There's 8 cups of what it's called medium rye flour. And then 4 cups of white flour. And this, by adding the white flour, it, it makes it so that it isn't, it isn't too heavy. And then I'm going to put in, I also like to add a little more yeast because, because the rye flour is so heavy that if you add a little bit more yeast, it will help it to rise and it won't take quite so long. So in that goes, that's one package of yeast with two-thirds cup of water. Now whether or not to Add, add more yeast depends very much on what the weather is like. If it's a warm day, the, if you add more yeast, a whole package more yeast, it's going to rise too quickly. And what you want it to do, and this is the good old French system again, which makes very good bread, is to the, for the second rising that this is going to have to have, is that it should last about three hours. And that depends very much on the temperature. And what you want to do is to make it rise, take about three hours and, and control the temperature if it's rising too fast. Just slow it down, even put it in the ice box if necessary. And then we have to have some more water because we've got all that flour in there. So I'm going to put in about two and two-thirds cup of water. And if I need any more, I can add some later. And then we also have to have some salt. And I'm going to put in three and a three and a third tablespoons, or three tablespoons and one teaspoon, if you prefer. Now, this is at this is the point at the, after you've started mixing your bread like this, where you can really do very much what you want. I'm making the very plain French type of rye flour. I'm not making Swedish or Jewish or Norwegian rye, all of some of which have milk or buttermilk or molasses and caraway seeds in them. At this point, you can do anything you want. And rather than 
putting in rye flour, you could have put in whole wheat flour, or you could make a mixture of whole wheat or rye, and you can add wheat germ and whole grains and organic this and that, and honey and molasses and whatnot. This is what's fun about bread making, you can very much do what you want, because the yeast is going to make it rise anyway. And that's what's such fun about bread, because it's your own. Now with this bread mixer, you need this by turning the crank and you're really kneading the bread. And you have to knead for about 10 or 15 minutes. And if it begins feeling too stiff, open it up and see how it looks. I'm going to open it up now and see how it looks. And it looks, I may have to add a little bit of more water later on, but you can't tell yet because it hasn't really started to go. I have three pails here so that you can see the bread, the dough at several stages. But of course you only need one. I would say if one is good, three is better. So you just keep on kneading, probably about 10 minutes. And one thing, I think a pail is very good for rye bread because rye is really so sticky. It's, I don't know why wallpaper hangers use white flour because it seems to me that the wallpaper would stick much better with rye flour. And I for this kind of bread, I think the dough pail is particularly useful. It's also very nice because it is just about the right size so that you can make a big mixture like this 12 cups of flour and you have plenty of room to rise. Now there I'll leave you that and go to my second pail to show you how it looks when it's already done. See there you are. You clean it off, clean the dough off the hook and then it's ready for its for its rise, and in this case it only needs, because it's already had that rise with the yeast batter, so it only needs one more rise. And it should rise if you can control the temperature at about 75 degrees for, if you can do it, three hours, two, two to three hours, but if you can have a long, slow rise, you're going to have a much better, a much better texture of bread. And that is because the yeast is the yeast has three functions, not only to make the dough rise, but to give it texture and to give it flavor. And if you don't if you don't let it work long enough, it's just not gonna have that marvelous flavor, and there's no sense in making homemade bread, because what you want to do is when you, you want your own bread to be infinitely better than anything you can buy. So remember in making bread, if you haven't worked with yeast much before, that it's not the time of rise. Some people say, oh, it said three hours, and here it is three hours and a half, and my bread hasn't risen. Oh, oh. That doesn't make any difference. It can take six hours to rise. This, it's the amount of rise, and when it has risen, it should come up to the, to the top of this pail and be have a lovely, soft texture. It's rather puffy, and it has a, and it's, already, and if you feel it, it's spongy. So remember that it's not the time of rise, it's the amount of rise. It, this should rise two to two and a half times its original, its original amount, and then it should have that soft, spongy, rather puffy look to it. And so when it's all ready, it comes out, and you're ready to form it. Now look at Look at the texture there as that comes out of the pail. You can feel just the feel of it. It has, it has the right kind of feel of risen dough and also the smell. And scrape it out. <laughs> and this is when you really, this is actually the first time that using the bread pail system that hands have touched dough, but you can see how really, really sticky that is. Now you can make, you can make the dough 
just in a, in a bread pan, just like that, and come out with just the conventional loaf. Or you can do, you can form it rather free form like this, and bake it free, which is a great deal more fun if you can make yourself a simulated baker's oven, which we've already done several times with French bread and with, with pizzas. So I'm going to do it in the freeform way, just because it's, a, it's more fun to do. I don't think this would be much to show you if we were just going to do something in a pan. And I'm going to make a great big loaf called a pan boulot. And that's a big, that's a big oval shaped loaf I'm going to take off an extra piece of that dough. And I th if you will remember with our French dough forming, it's very much the same method of patting it out with your hand and then lifting one end, the lower end, up almost to the top and then folding the top down to the lower end. The whole idea here is to try and make a smooth bottom, and then flatten it again, and then make a trench down there with the side of your hand, and hope that that's going to look like a smooth bottom. And if it hasn't, just pat it out again, and make another trench, and fold it again. Well, it still doesn't seem terribly smooth, so I'll do it once again. And then seal the ends of it with the with the heel of your hand. And be sure that you don't make it too long for your oven. And this amount of dough is going to make the the amount of dough that I had will make two long loaves, about 16 or 18 inches long. Or it would make two round loaves, about 12 or 14 inches in diameter. But with the free form, you're never exactly quite sure how much you're going to get. I mean, that doesn't make sense. This doesn't make any sense at all. So I think when you're doing rye bread and things like that, you sometimes you add a little more water or a little more yeast, and you can't say exactly how much you're going to end up with. But I always think a little bit more is better than a little bit less. Now this is going to go on to canvas that is floured. You see how soft that is? That's real French type. And now you have the question if you were this sometimes spreads out a bit, and I'm going to try and find. So if you, if you had a Benetton, which is a French bread basket, you could let it rise in that. But another system, which my husband worked out, is to use your canvas like a sling, and either put it in the, shut it into a drawer, or shut it in, in the top of a door, like this. The great thing about this is sort of silly, but the thing is it keeps the bread from, from spreading out too much. And then you can unmold it either onto a baking sheet in the conventional way, or if you're going to use the simulated baker's oven, you unmold it onto a board and then you're going to slide it directly into your oven. So here, there was it always rises with a seal side up, so that you'll have the soft underbelly. And the rise is about, I should say, an hour and a half until it looks nice and puffy like this. It should be almost, have risen almost three times its original size. And this, with a little razor blade, making these little 
slash marks. And remember that the slashes just go almost parallel to the loaf. And if you haven't quite, quite gotten in there, do it, uh, go over it again. And then, because this is going to be like the baker's oven, we have a hot iron or a hot brick, then you have a pan of water in the oven. And we gotta make steam. And here she goes. You see that bubbling in there? And then we have hot tiles in the oven. Look at that steam. That just slides in there sideways. And that bakes for about five minutes with the steam. And then you take the steam out and the oven is at 450 degrees and you let it bake for about 20 to 30 minutes and then you turn the oven down to about 350 and let it bake 20 to 30 minutes more until it thumps nicely now if you don't have the bricks and the uh, the, the tiles and the iron just bake it on a baking sheet in the ordinary way but i think you're going to like bread that's made this way with a yeast starter and it's very much like an even older system in France, which they call pain au levain, spelled L-E-V-A-I-N. And this is made with leftover dough, and we visited a bakery when we were in Paris that baked the bread this way. And you enter into this, this very <coughs> modern bakery shop on the first floor, and then you descend into a medieval cavern where the bread is baked day and night in a never-ending cycle. And there's the levain. That's the leftover dough. And they're putting more flour and water into it. And that, after it's all mixed up, it's really just like a pouliche. It's like a batter. This is a French bread pail or an electric mixer. There's the wood fire. It's so hot in there that they always wear shorts. And that's all needed. So he's dumping it into a big tub where it's going to rise. Now they weigh it out. So each piece of dough is weighed so that all the bread will be exactly the same size. You see how soft that is too. And he's making the round shape in the just the same way as Professor Calvell made his. There's your wood fire. Now, rather than a hot iron, and a pan, he's just using a plain pan of water that puts steam in the oven. And that's his wooden paddle that he slides the dough in, called a pell, P-E-double-L-E, -L -L -E, called a peel sometimes. Bread being 
unmold it onto it. And he's making the slash marks. He keeps the razor in his mouth. That's a cornmeal. Finally, the bread is baked, and there it is. bread is wheeled right upstairs into the shop and it's sold all over Paris and even all over France and even some of it is air shipped over to this country. And this is the, these are the round type of round loaves. And actually I think that the round loaves keep their shape back better if you do have one of these benetons, these baskets, canvas lined and made out of wicker. And to get them, you'll probably have to go over to France, and it's really worth the trip. But even so, here's one that was just baked not in a Benetton. I must say, it's, it's come up very well, so I don't, I don't think they're essential at all. But I must say, I think that our sling works very well. Here's a small one done in a sling. And here is a great, a great big one. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like when you cut it open. I always like to cut them on a slant this way. See, it's got a beautiful brown crust, and inside it's moist and brown and tasty and earthy. It's a really, it's a life-sustaining, real rye bread. It's a virgin rye, and really, What's to remember here that it's a great method for any bread. It's one that you can improvise on, and you can really start your own traditions. So that's all for today. On The French Chef, this is Julia Child. Bon appétit. The French Chef has been made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Julia Child is co-author of Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volumes 1 and 2.